Hi everybody, uh, my name is Kino Mardin and uh, I'm here to talk today about uh, breaking transmission chains uh, with JavaScript. Uh, so it's lovely to be here. Um, first, I'd like to give you a little bit of my own background. Um, so I'm 42 years old, I'm a computer scientist. Uh, and I live in a small town called Tremor uh, in County Waterford, which is in the southeast of Ireland. Um, I live with my wife Amelia, my three kids, and uh, you know I've done I've I've done some interesting things in my career. Uh, you know, primarily you know founded Nearform um, uh, about nine years ago, uh, NodeConf for you, uh, and some other things. So a little bit about Nearform. Um, started a company about nine years ago. Uh, we've been pretty successful. We're about two hundred people now. Uh, operating out of about 20 countries. Everybody works remotely at our, our company. And what we do is we design, we build, and we operate web, mobile, and cloud platforms at scale, uh, primarily for public companies and, and tech uh, companies. Uh, we're really, really big advocates uh, for web open source. Um, and we've been major contributors to the Node.js project uh, for a number of years now, um, both Node Core itself and the module ecosystem uh, and also we've been contributors to the React ecosystem more recently. Um, so enough about me. Uh, so today I want to tell you the story of how we built uh, the most widely used exposure notification app in the world uh, last year. Um, it's a pretty, uh, pretty amazing adventure. Uh, probably one of the best, uh, best adventures I've had in my, uh, in my career. Um, so uh, before I jump into it, I'd like to give you a little bit of my own story. So at the end of February, uh, of January last year, uh, I went on a business trip to London, a uh, three-day business trip. And uh, uh, on the way there, just before I arrived at my hotel, um, having gone through Heathrow and uh, Dublin Airport on the way, uh, it started to feel like I had some, some kind of thing stuck in my throat. Um, I started to feel a little bit unwell. Uh, but I, you know, met the team, we went out, had dinner, uh, got back to the hotel. Um, and, uh, the next couple of days I, I kind of had to drag myself around the place a little bit. I was, I, I felt like I had some kind of sickness, um, uh, but it wasn't too bad. Uh, but really had to like look after my energy levels, uh, get through things and, uh, just about made it through the final, the third day uh, on my trip, and then uh, got on a plane, came back to Ireland, and got home to my my young family. Um, and uh, as as much as I tried to be uh, upbeat and and full of energy coming home, I really didn't feel that well. So um, that weekend, uh, I started to get a fever. Um, I developed a really bad cough, um, and it, it was a cough which was bad to the point of uh, almost vomiting from um the kind of coughing that I was doing and uh and so eventually on Sunday I went to to go and see the doctor um and 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 you know the night before I, I'd been in bed kind of looking at some of this stuff they were talking about a pandemic coming out of China and uh, all these things happening in the news so I was kind of thinking in the back of my head I couldn't have like this this COVID thing that they're talking about I went to the doctor and the doctor examined me and he said you have a chest infection and you have a flu uh, which was kind of an unusual combination of things. Um, so he gave me some antibiotics and other things that didn't do any good for me at all. I went home um, and I got into bed and uh, I was really, really sick. Um, I had a high fever. Um, I, I had shortness of breath and wheezed for the first time in my entire life. Uh, I just felt really, really crummy. Um, interesting thing is my wife also got sick that week. And she went to the doctor and the doctor said to her, you have a chest infection and a flu and gave her more antibiotics and things that didn't do very much for her. She wasn't too bad with it, but I was I was pretty sick. So um, I really struggled over the next three or four weeks to try and uh, get back to work. Um, found that I wasn't like I go back to work for a couple of days, then I'd end up back in bed again. Um, so it really took me like about five weeks to get over it. Um, the funny thing is that, um, you know, during the first week that I spent in bed, um, I was, I spent more time reading about this, like this new virus that they were talking about, and maybe there's going to be a pandemic and all that stuff. And I said to my wife that there's a pandemic coming and, and she, she was like laughing at me saying like, you know, don't believe everything you see on the internet, all that good stuff. Um, 
but like ultimately I was, I was proven to be right. And, uh, uh, and, and things got pretty, uh, scary in the world. Um, you know, in February and March of last year, um, I guess I characterize how things were, uh, for me anyway, I, I felt like for somebody that's, that's really tried to take control of my life and, and make things happen that this external event had happened. And, and I felt, just felt really powerless. Like there was nothing I could particularly do to, to make a difference to what was going on in the world. And, uh, everyone else I'm sure felt the same way. Um, so they declared a pandemic eventually, um, you know, we watched with horror, uh, what was going on in Italy in March of last year. Uh, and the Irish government then were going to lock down the country. You know, the shops ran out of toilet roll. They ran out of flour. Uh, everybody was really, really scared. And and uh, in Ireland, they cancelled the St. Patrick's Day parade for the first time, which is pretty crazy. Like, um, so anyway, the weekend of uh, after St. Patrick's Day parade, I got a call from uh, a man who works for the health service executive in Ireland um, asking if I could uh, potentially help the health service executive to build an app to help to deal with the pandemic. Uh, and, uh, and of course, I, was, I wanted to do what I could do. Um, I called up some of the team here on a Sunday night. Uh, they started like to uh, gather requirements together uh, and we started prototyping uh, what an app would look like. Um, and uh, and so uh, we um, we started to put it together, uh, and uh, and we started building what what ended up becoming uh, the COVID tracker app. Um, so um, so I guess the the things that I would say around building the COVID tracker uh, that are important would would be like that. Um, in terms of building the app, uh, there were some core principles that we discussed at the very beginning. Um, one was empowering people. Uh, we felt that a, an app that just did exposure notifications and exposure notifications are when you're, when you're in proximity of somebody else for a number of minutes, uh, typically a six foot proximity for 15 minutes. Um, uh, if one, if, if the person you have, you have the app, the other person is the app exchange Bluetooth key and one person gets infected and the other person gets told about it. We felt that, that just having that functionality within an app itself wouldn't be enough to keep people engaged. And so we thought about how can we empower people? So we put in like a, a check-in daily check-in function to the app, a symptom tracker, uh, and then also some data on what's happening around infections in your local area. Um, we knew that the app needed to be privacy first and privacy protecting. That was the most important thing because if people don't trust the technology, they're not going to download it. They're not going to install it. Uh, so we made sure that everything uh, within the app was optional. It was really clearly labeled. Um, we knew uh, transparency was going to be really, really important uh, around how the app was being built and what all the things in it meant. And um, because because people, in, you know, a lot of people don't trust technology. Um, and so the final thing then was that it would be easy to use, that we cater from people who were you know, from 15 to 85 years of age. So we started working on this. Um, we built uh, from that Sunday night, uh, 10 days later on Wednesday, the 1st of April, uh, we had a working version of uh, what is now the COVID tracker app. Uh, it had a custom Bluetooth stack that we developed because there didn't exist at the time any official uh, uh, exposure notification API from Google and Apple. Um, and so uh, a couple of weeks later, uh, Apple and Google announced uh, they were releasing the exposure notification API for iOS and Android. Um, and, and then a decision was made pretty quickly that we were going to like not use our, our homegrown uh, Bluetooth stack and we we're going to adopt this. So we had to go and rebuild this thing. We had to uh, retest it. And uh, we did that during May and June of, of the year. Um, we also uh, had to do things like add multi-language support. Um, we did like accelerated behavioral studies. So we really looked at the language in the app. Uh, you know, things like, you know, uh, when I download the app, am I protecting myself? Am I protecting others? Like what, what, what are the best ways to describe things? What are going to get people uh, to use the app? Um, we worked with accessibility groups in advance of launch. Uh, and then the big things, uh, the really big things, 
uh, where uh, the people working for the health service executive in Ireland produced a data protection impact assessment, which is a human readable document that described everything going on with the app, all the data that was traveling around, uh, what the impact was. And that was that was published three weeks before the launch of the app. Um, and also with that, then we, we also published the source code for the app three weeks before the launch. And these are really important things. So, uh, so it, you know, uh, the COVID tracker app was born. Um, this is a couple of screenshots here. You have uh, the login screen on the, uh, the, the, the front page screen on the very left hand side here. You get some uh, information about the number of people that have checked in today, how many are feeling good, how many have had some symptoms, what's happening nationally. You can click into that. Uh, and various other things. And then there's some of the other pieces of um, uh, some other screens about the setup and registration of the app, uh, uh, how many people have downloaded it and uh, and what happens if you get a close contact. And, and so the app was launched, uh, we did a soft launch on the 6th of July. Um, and uh, within a day or so, uh, the app really, really took off. Uh, so we ended up with like over 20 million API calls per day uh on aws uh really really quickly um so when the app launched on uh eventually i think some of the tweets that people sent out were really nice uh you know here's someone talking about the data protection uh you know the impact uh, uh protection impact information is written in plain english uh people can opt in and opt out uh, and it doesn't access your file camera etc this is really important stuff um also that the app was written in React Native and TypeScript, um, and uh, the code is available on GitHub under an MIT license. And that's really important to people who can uh, can see what's going on and, and want to trust it. So the Minister for Health in Ireland, Stephen Donnelly, uh, launched the app uh, formally on July 7th. Um, actually, it turns out it was my birthday that day, uh, and, uh, and it was a huge success. Um, so uh, the plan had been that, that uh, it was going to be a soft launch for the first week, see how it goes. And then there was going to be a big PR campaign. And on July the 7th, um, uh, Ireland really stood up that day uh, and uh, everybody got behind the app. Uh, people are talking about it on the radio, on television, uh, on social media, and uh, lots of celebrities, different people got behind it. And they were like, we need to do this. We, we and. I think a lot of the work in the behavioral studies and, and the messaging was really important. This is about protecting each other and standing up together to, to beat COVID. Mm -hmm. And so um, we ended up having more than a million people uh, started using the app in the first 24 hours uh, from launch. Um, and it was, it was a huge success. Um, so scaling. Um, so once we had launched the app and we were, well, we were getting close to launching the app, a number of other governments started talking to us um, because, uh, you know, all the health departments talked to each other um, and uh, word was going around that we were doing something the right way. Um, so we started really thinking at this stage about, well, how can we focus on rolling out this technology as quickly as possible? Like we really wanted to respond uh, to the need that was happening out there in the shortest amount of time that we could, uh, you know, making, making the project open source, uh, was a really, uh, really important part um, of, uh, of of the approach. Um, everyone can download it. Any government can download it, use it for free, um, and uh, you know, um, it just made a lot of sense to people. Um, so, in particular, once the first government had actually built this thing and rolled it out and tested it, then being able to access all the work and all 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 the uh, you know, the, the backing of all that work that had gone into it, um, you know, made a lot of sense for somebody else that wanted to pick it up or, or versus like build something from scratch. Um, the other thing was that we, we really weren't in this to make money. So, uh, the cost per system after the first one was about 25% of the original implementation. So really we were just trying to customize, uh, the work that had already been done, uh, and get people up and running as quickly as possible. And, um, and the other piece is that the, you know, each implementation like added to the strength of the overall open source project. So, um, you know, features that that are, are, are things that uh, one government in one jurisdiction might need uh, will get committed to the project uh, and go back into the master branch and then the other governments will get to access that and, and get a benefit from it. So 
is a really good test case for open source. Um, kind of proud moment for us, uh, you know, in the middle of doing all this rollout was that uh, we'd started getting some traction in Europe um, with the, the project. Um, and then uh, we started getting uh, some initial conversations going in the United States. And, and so it became important for us to put the, the project into a neutral uh, repository. So we created this project with the HSE uh, called the COVID Green. Uh, it's green for Ireland. Uh, and it's also uh, green for the map turning green again uh, as, as COVID disappears. Um, so we put it into Linux Foundation and um, and from there then uh, things really started to roll. So uh, we launched the app in Ireland, uh, in North of Ireland, in Scotland, uh, in Gibraltar, and then in Delaware, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, uh, and, and Jersey um, in the uh, part of the, uh, the Commonwealth. Um, and finally, um, New Zealand actually launched using the source code without, without us needing to help them uh, near the end of the year last year. So the highlights of the project. Um, for me, the, the highlights of this project uh, were like the, the, the nature of what we achieved in a, in a short amount of time. So, you know, we managed to do all this, uh, a team of no more than about 15 people working in your form, uh, managed to, you know, take the first call on the 22nd of March. And uh, by 26 weeks later, we did our last deployment, which was uh, uh, New Jersey. Uh, so, you know, we got on it, we solved the problem. We worked really closely with government and, um, we created this open source project and then we did this rollout all over the place uh to many governments in a really short space of time and um it's a big uh big big career highlight for me and be proud of all the people at Nearform for managing to to make this happen um you know in ireland we got about 40 percent of the adult population were using the COVID tracker at its height um uh which is pretty impressive and uh the app itself uh, saved lives, uh, significant number of lives, and uh, reduced a lot, prevented a lot of people from getting sick. Um, and the other thing is that Ireland and the north of Ireland, uh, so north of Ireland were a second rollout. Uh, they were the first two countries, uh, the, the first two uh, health uh, services in the world uh, to interoperate and have like a, a common uh, format um where people could use the app in the north of ireland north of ireland app and come down south and it would work uh perfectly well um in summary um i'd like to think that we're we're going to be much more well prepared for the next pandemic lots of learnings lots of uh lots of assets in place now um infrastructure like COVID green uh uh and things like this i really think that it's perfect it's a perfect uh, use case for open source uh and and infrastructure like this should be in the public domain like you know the problems that we have in one country that we have to address by and large are the same as the problems we have in other countries um and uh the open source approach uh itself has has done some really interesting things it's created a lot of new connections uh so you know the work we've done has managed to create a, a network between 10 10 different health health uh, bodies from ireland to pennsylvania uh whereby uh over time we'd like to like make this into a bigger thing and we'd like to get more health health um uh, bodies talking to each other and innovating and sharing what they're learning sharing what they're creating and that can only be a good thing um so um yeah i hope you found this talk informative uh it's been a real pleasure to get to work on something like this uh i really like to thank uh, everyone at nearform um, later on in the conference, uh, a number of near formers are going to talk about uh, the, the, actually the building of the technology, the operating of the technology. Um, you can hit me up on Kian Omadine on Twitter. And uh, if you want information about COVID Green, uh, you can go to github.com uh, slash COVID Green and check out the repository. Thank you very much.